Tsai Center for Innovative Thinking at Yale's Fireside Chat with Joseph Tsai. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Claire Lineweber, Executive Director of the Tsai Center for Innovative Thinking at Yale, or Tsai City. Before I introduce our honored guest, as well as my fellow moderators, I'd like to take a moment to talk to you about the mission and work of Tsai City. Our mission is to inspire students from diverse backgrounds and disciplines to seek innovative ways to solve real world problems. We do this through offering experiential learning programs, mentorship and funding for student innovators. The center launched in 2017. We are now at the start of our fourth year of operation. Last academic year, Tsai City worked with over 1400 students representing all Yale schools. We supported students pursuing more than 100 different ventures and special projects. The format for this afternoon is a one hour in depth chat with Joe Tsai. Each of three moderators will address a different area of inquiry with Joe. Joining me as moderators are Angelica Gonzalez, Associate Professor of Biomedical Engineering and Tsai City's Faculty Director, and Jean Viev Lu, Yale College Senior and Co Chair of the Tsai City Student Advisory Board. We'll reserve about 13 minutes for Q&A at the end of the chat. Q&A participation is limited to current Yale students. Please use the Q&A function to submit questions. Be sure to include your name, degree program, and expected graduation year along with your question. A recording will be made available to those registered for the chat in approximately one week. Now it's my very great pleasure to introduce you to Joe Tsai, alumnus of Yale College and the Yale Law School, co-founder and executive vice chairman of Alibaba Group, governor of the Brooklyn Nets and New York Liberty, and chairman of the team's home arena Barclays Center. Joe also owns the San Diego Seals, a professional indoor lacrosse team in the National Lacrosse League. Joe played varsity lacrosse at Yale and is a longtime supporter of the Yale men's and women's lacrosse teams. While well, Joe's accomplishments comprise a significantly longer list than this, I want to make sure we use our time with him wisely. So I trust that our audience today will find additional information elsewhere. And I'm going to say again, Joe, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Claire. Very happy to be here. So I want to focus my portion of our discussion on the thinking behind the creation of Tsai City. So my first question to you is this, why was creating a center of innovative thinking important to you and why locate such a center at a university? Well, it's, it's important because um, I, I was having a conversation with uh, Peter Salove. This is how, how this all started. And, and Peter was saying that uh, Yale is strong in humanities and, uh, uh, and Yale was embarking on a uh, sort of an initiative to strengthen its uh, various science departments. And uh, the conversation quickly moved toward, well, should we do something in computer science uh, and uh, also something that's STEM related? Um, and we kind of started to go down this rabbit hole um, until I said, stop. Uh, you know, the, the idea of being innovative and also being entrepreneurial is not just limited to scientists, even though we know that scientists and engineers like to solve problems, but there are a lot of different problems in the world that, uh, you know, social scientists, economists, English majors, historians, uh, people from all walks of life, from all disciplines uh, are facing problems. And uh, let's just focus the effort on problem solving and using innovative ways to, to, to do that. And uh, uh, then the next thing is to think about what kind of center uh, this is going to look like. Uh, do we call it the center of innovation or the center on entrepreneurship? Uh, now, if you paid attention, this is called uh, the uh, center for innovative thinking. So what it implies is that the process of thinking through problems uh, is really the emphasis rather than the idea itself. We're in a place of learning and you ask about why we locate the center at Yale. Uh, it's very simple because uh, we have a captive pool of uh, people, young people that are eager to learn and it's the process of learning and the process of acquiring knowledge and thinking through problems 
uh, that's most important. Obviously, we hope that at some point, in, uh, you know, once they've uh, been involved in the program at Sci City, some of their ideas can blossom and they can take those ideas and uh, continue to uh, take that to fru fruition. Uh, but I think it, the thinking process itself is very, very important. Uh, so uh, that's where that's how we uh, came up with uh, the the Thai city idea, and uh, uh, and I'm very happy to see that now we have a building of our own. Uh, people can uh, come. It's also important uh, to have a place, a physical place where people can gather. Now, it sounds funny now we're you know in a COVID environment to say that, but there's going to be a time when uh, people come back to campus. I know that there are already students on campus at Yale, uh, but uh, people can congregate in the building and share ideas and exchange, having that exchange. So again, that process is very, very important. Yes, I sometimes think that uh, the innovative thinking process is analogous to the critical thinking process that universities for you know, millennia <laughs> have uh, inculcated in their students um, how to apply. It is very much a mindset and process oriented. I completely agree with you. That's very much what we're aiming for. And, and when you think about what you hope to see as um, like the fruits of, of Tsai City's work um, in the short term, but then also in the longer term. So five years from now, uh, what, what, what does success look like for Tsai City? And then, you know, 25, 30 years from now, um, a generation from now, what, what will success look like for Tsai City? Five years from now, um, what I hope to see is uh, some of the projects that were incubated in Tsai City uh, are taken outside the, the, this context uh, when the students can uh, leave the Yale campus and continue to, uh, you know, put in the effort and continue their projects and see some of these uh, ideas come to fruition. Uh, I think that that would be a great thing. I know that uh, there are just so many, so much diversity in the types of uh, projects uh, that everybody is working on. Um, but to see that not just being incubated on campus, but outside of uh, the, the academic environment, uh, post-graduation for people to continue to work on them, uh, I would love to see that. Uh, I guess the 25 year horizon is, in 25 years, I want every young person, every high school graduate to say, hey, I wanna go to Yale because of Tsai City. And they have an awesome lacrosse team. When, when you reflect on your time here at Yale, you were twice at Yale, once undergraduate and once for law school. Um, what, when, when you imagine that, what do you think you might have, how might you have engaged with a, with a center like Sci City? Uh, what, so, the, so the question is when I was here, how would I have engaged? As, yes, as a student, yes. Well, I, I still remember as a student, uh, things were very structured. Uh, you, go, you went to class, uh, you had uh, office hours with your professors, uh, you had uh, a sort of a, a time of uh, camaraderie with your fellow students, you uh, uh, discuss ideas and things like that. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, there wasn't a place where you could go and just say, you know, I want to meet some new people. Um, uh, I think Yale is a place, the, co the whole college system is great uh, because you actually have and an enclosed group of people that get to know each other very, very well. So from a social standpoint, that's excellent. But if, if you wanna step out of your college and uh, go to a place where you can meet some new people, get fresh ideas, uh, maybe um, you know, the uh, cross-campus library um, is, would have been the place, I don't know. Um, and uh, uh, so, so I think now with, with Thai City, especially we now have a physical building uh, uh, it, it, it offers resources that uh, I never had when I was a Yale student. Um, and uh, so, so I think uh, we, we should take advantage of that. Yes, we're excited to be co-located our neighbors with the uh, makerspace the, it, with the engineering school, the Center for Engineering Innovation and Design. Um, 
we think there's going to be a lot of organic back and forth once once all the spaces are open and and uh, traffic can go easily back and forth between the two spaces I think there'll be um, a lot of really interesting mixing and mingling where students who would have would not have crossed paths or have an opportunity to cross paths with each other yeah for sure so I'm going to turn this over to our, my co-moderator, uh, Angelica Gonzalez. Uh, she's going to ask you some big picture questions about uh, Yale students' innovative thinking in Sci City. Hi, Angelica. Hi, Joe. So good to meet you. I'm doing well. Um, I'm sitting here in front of a picture of the outdoor of the new building. So um, we're grateful. It's beautiful. Thankful to have such a, a great building. And um, as uh, Claire said, it's adjacent to the Center for Engineering and Innovative Design, but also to um, uh, the School of Engineering and Applied Science building. So engineering is excited to become involved with everything that SciCity is doing. Uh, I wanted to ask you a few questions about big picture perspectives. Um, over the last six months, we've all gone through uh, a, a great deal of unprecedented change, uncertainty uh, with regards to public health economic, social, and political challenges all over the world. It's in the news every day. How have you been thinking about these issues in the context of risk, resilience, and innovative thinking? Well, first, I think we have to identify what the problems are. And uh, there are some very large, very macro issues uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, is, is, is facing everyone in, in the world. Uh, first of all, um, I think because of uh, the Asian, uh, not the Asian, but the global financial crisis back in 2008, uh, the uh, uh, governments have been, uh, or central banks have been pumping a lot of money, liquidity into the system, which actually created a a bubble economy. And this bubble economy is a problem because it actually separated the gap between the haves and have nots. Uh, the gap had, had already been pretty wide, but it ex uh, exacerbated that gap because uh, when you have a lot of liquidity in the system, people who own assets, that's stocks, bonds, property, you know, real estate, uh, do better. And people who don't own assets, uh, but depend on kind of paychecks every month uh, to, to make a living uh, are being left behind. And that's been the last 15 years of, um, you know, this, uh, well, not exactly 15, I think it's 12 years of uh, this kind of uh, distortion. Uh, I think also with the advent of technology, uh, uh, you have a lot of uh, workers that are displaced. That's even accentuated the problem. Uh, the, the third whammy is COVID, uh, where, you know, we're sitting here in a very comfortable setting, the academic environment, uh, you know, in the business environment. But the whole idea of work from home, if you think about it, is a very elitist concept. A lot, there are a lot of jobs in the world the frontline workers, uh, people who cannot work from home and they now can't, you know, make a living, uh, they're not getting paid because they can't work. So you, you, you kind of have all of these factors that come in, uh, which created this uh, huge disparity between the rich and the poor. And I think that's the first problem that, and, and I think that is the biggest problem uh, that we need to solve. Uh, we need to really uh, get to the bottom of uh, trying to find solutions for uh, some of these economic issues. Um, I don't have all the answer, uh, but I think uh, as people come to Thai City for uh, their projects, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think you have to start from the ground up, start, starting with helping the communities. Uh, and and uh, I, I hope that there will be some projects that will be focused on uh, how do we level the playing field? How do we uh, narrow the gap of income disparity and wealth disparity? 
that's such an interesting observation because I think what you're saying is that uh, economic disparities are really the, the source of health disparities, of social um, disparities, of educational disparities that we see across the globe. And so it's really uh, interesting and enlightening to hear how, how you, you're thinking about connecting those issues. Um, I, I guess the next question then is as you look forward and as you're looking ahead and forecasting, um, uh, where, where do you look uh, for both short-term and long-term inspiration to the challenges and opportunities in entrepreneurial, entrepreneurialship, but also um, innovation? Um, well, I always have faith in young people. Um, I'm not that young anymore. I still would like to think that I, I can go out and play a game of uh, pick up basketball, but uh, uh, I think uh, investing in, in, in the future is about investing uh, not just the, the resources, but also time and attention to educating uh, young people. And uh, uh, I, I think what, when it comes to uh, problem solving, and let's say we, if we want to narrow the gap in some of the social disparities, uh, I think it's absolutely important that uh, people can find a common place or a common language to actually uh, interact with each other and debate ideas. Uh, so, uh, you know, what I have seen is when you have uh, young people that are, they have read up on the, uh, the, uh, the subject matter, when they're properly uh, educated about a subject matter, then there's going to be constructive debate. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's gonna be very, that's, that's, that, that'll be very important. So building that common language, uh, you know, a, a way of talking to each other, a way to debate ideas, I think is fundamental uh, to solving uh, some of the biggest, most challenging problems in the world. So when I look at uh, the signs of innovation, uh, uh, I wanna see that people can actually properly debate ideas. Right now, we have too much shouting at each other uh, type of phenomenon, and that's not healthy. No, I think that's absolutely clear. It's been clear that polarization seems to minimize the efficient action that can take place. And so um, it's great to hear you say that. Um, I, I guess I wanted to touch on one last point um, and thinking about uh, polarization and differences in our society, how they impact one another, how they impact innovation and, um, and uh, um, creation. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about diversity. Uh, in August, late August, you um, uh, announced a five point action plan. Uh, towards um, developing equity and, um, and and diversity in your your um, companies, the companies that you're involved with, and um, the many entities that you uh, lead. So, can can you tell us a little bit about that? And what, how do you um, enact such clear and decisive action around uh, innovation that's focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yeah, so, so this, uh, the background is the Brooklyn Nets and the NBA. Uh, uh, since uh, the, uh, the uh, killing of George Floyd several months ago, um, I think the country has been thrown into kind of a turmoil. And uh, the teams and the, uh, the team owners and the players in the NBA have kind of felt this very strongly. Uh, I mean, the fact is, uh, the NBA, we have a league where uh, our elite players, our stars, uh, um, you know, have 70, 80 percent are uh, black. And uh, this is very, very personal to our players. And by extension, uh, you know, as we have these conversations with our players, you know, I start to realize that uh, the, the, the issue of racial injustice uh, is a deep rooted problem with 400 plus years of history uh, that you can't solve overnight, but you have to face it like directly. Uh, you have to face it now. You have to have that conversation. You can't skirt it. Uh, so that's why my wife and I started a, 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 an initiative uh, to say that we're going to not only put money resources behind uh, a social justice program, but also 
uh, look inward and look at our own organization. Are we diverse enough? Are we, uh, uh, you know, are we doing everything we can to promote the social justice cause, especially uh, the, the, the issue uh, that's facing uh, the black community uh, today? The, the fact is, uh, you know, I, I never come across this. You know, when I see a policeman on the streets, I don't run the other way. I, I don't, there's no fear. But as I have conversations with, you know, our players and also some friends, uh, people that we, 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 we know uh, uh, who are black, they, they start to, uh, they start to pour out. I mean, they, they just, you know, it's very, very emotional conversation. We've been in a lot of these emotional conversations about the kind of uh, life that they, they lead. That's just different because uh, certain people see other people by the skin of their color and not by what they do and what they accomplish. So, uh, so for us, it's very, very important to uh, launch our social justice plan uh, to talk about diversity uh, a little bit. I, I think uh, people have to recognize that the foundation of excellence is diversity. Is, and I, as I said, if you can't debate ideas, then you're not going to find uh, the best solution. So only through diversity can you bring uh, different people together with different experience, background, uh, ways of thinking into one place. And, and you know, the diversity is just as important as the freedom of speech, which is guaranteed by the First Amendment. This freedom of speech, the basis of that is that everybody comes to a place, there's a marketplace of ideas. You want to have free flowing ideas. So why wouldn't you want to have free flowing people, different kinds of people, different backgrounds, and come and contribute to uh, a problem and work toward the same cause? So. So to me, diversity is just as important as the First Amendment. That's a remarkable answer. And I've got to tell you, uh, personally, thank you so much for acknowledging that the experience of Black Americans is different from that of many other Americans. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to uh, my co-moderator, Jean-Bierre Lou, who is co-chair of the Student Advisory Board. Jean-Bierre? Hi. Hi, jean um, <laughs> Great to see you. How are you? Um, I'm doing well. Um, so I'm going to be providing sort of some of the micro level questions, the micro perspective. Um, and, and this comes from my perspective as not only the co-chair at SciCity, but also a senior at Yale. Um, so my first question for you is sort of coming full circle as you think about the mission of SciCity, how do you connect it to the world today and the importance of diversity, as you mentioned? And, and not just diversity, but diversity of backgrounds, of disciplines, innovative thinking, and, and most of all, solving real world problems. Yeah, um, um, I think we, we had a little bit of a conversation about that in the pre-meeting uh, uh, about uh, just uh, the idea of how do we marry um, innovation, entrepreneurship, and also uh, s people that are socially minded, right? S uh, s solving social problems and espousing social causes. I think all of this is not mutually exclusive. Uh, and as I said, uh, entrepreneurship is not about making money. Uh, it's about finding a problem and then going out to solve a problem. So the best entrepreneurs what they do is they try to solve the customer's problems. They identify a problem and then they solve it. And that's what we say uh, when we, we use the term mission-driven company, uh, even though you have these companies that make lots of profits, for-profit businesses, you could still be mission-driven because your mission is that you have identified something that you want to solve. Um, and a lot of these big problems are social problems. Uh, so going back, for example, to the roots of uh, Alibaba, the problem that we were trying to solve was to help small businesses to succeed. Uh, uh, in the pre-internet age, <laughs> you know, I have to start talking about 1999, maybe you know, before some of you guys are born. Um, the uh, pre-internet uh, companies, small companies just don't have the resources to compete with big companies. But now with the internet, uh, you level the playing field. 
uh, companies if they want to do marketing. Now you see a lot of small mar small companies or even individuals that can market themselves even better than Procter and Gamble when they use of social media, uh, right? So I think this is this is an example of how we saw uh, solving problems for small businesses became our mission, and. Um, uh, so uh, I think, I, I don't know if that answers your question. No, that totally answers my question. And it's really, it's really cool to hear about your experience both founding Alibaba and then just thinking about all the amazing sort of companies and ideas and ventures that are coming out of Yale that are, I think, socially minded in so many ways, as you mentioned, both solving like very typically social issues and then also just thinking about the problems of everyday people. So. That was a really interesting answer. Um, I yeah. kind of, <laughs> I kind yeah, of no, I, I wanted to say that uh, when, you, uh, when you back a social cause to solve a social problem, that doesn't mean you have to be nonprofit. Right. Uh, because if you solve problems of society, you're gonna create value. Hmm. And uh, you, then you can uh, decide that if you want to take a slice of that value uh, for the company. Yeah, got it. Uh, yeah, so I, my second question for you is a little bit different. It's more about sort of your experience or just, I'd love to hear more about it. Um, but the question is, have you had to sort of revise your own plans personally and, and probably also professionally since last spring, uh, especially in response to the global health um, and financial, the, the global health crisis and the financial realities of the world today? And it'd be great if you could share a couple examples. Um, so, I, I kind of uh, hit an inflection point back in 2018. So this is before COVID. Um, uh, the, the watershed event was when Yale lacrosse won the national championship. Um, I went to the game um, and it was one of those moments where, uh, you know, I, I thought to myself a goal that I thought nobody thought would be attainable uh, was actually achieved, like maybe a couple of years ahead of time, ahead of schedule. If you talk to coach Andy Shea, he will say, no, that's, uh, he's been waiting like 14 years for it. But uh, so, so for me, you know, I started to think about how I, uh, I want to structure my, my life, uh, how to sort of replan my career or, uh, or replan my life. Um, I had already gotten to a stage of, uh, you know, relative uh, success and comfort. Uh, uh, and I decided that it was time for me to uh, slow down a little bit at uh, my full-time job at work and uh, start focusing on my family uh, and also uh, start focusing on my passion, which is I wanted to get into sports a little bit more. Um, and uh, obviously after that, you know, I, I bought uh, the Brooklyn Nets and uh, got into that. But speaking of uh, the pandemic and how that, that has changed, um, I think the biggest uh, uh, change is that I don't travel as much. Uh, and I have to say traveling is overrated. Uh, <laughs> when, when you're not, you know, in a rush running to airports and Pack. I mean, think about like every time you travel, uh, you have to pack and how much time you waste packing. Um, I, I was, uh, before the pandemic, I was traveling uh, across the Pacific something like twice a month. Uh, not just the time on the road, but also getting over jet lag uh, was taking a toll on my, on my health. And uh, so, it's definitely good not to travel. It help, helped me to uh, focus on what I really want to do. Helps me to think more and read more. I really enjoy that. No, that's, that's so cool to hear. Um, and it, I can't even imagine the jet lag. Um, the last question I have for you is not just asking for a friend, myself personally. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you have any advice for current students about how they should approach innovation and exploration of other projects. Um, both at Yale and, and also after graduation? Yes. Well, I, I think uh, a couple of things. First, you know, this is my advice to all young people, all students. Um, learn some fundamental skills 
uh, when you can. Uh, and I think uh, fundamental skills uh, today are very, very different from, you know, when I was a student 30, 40 years ago. Um, I think today we're in a, we live in a world where uh, there's going to be a lot of digitization of the world. So software is important. I would encourage all history majors and English majors and economics majors to take a lesson in coding, uh, whether it's Python or C++ or whatever coding language, um, uh, because I think it's important to understand uh, the, uh, how, the, how software works. Uh, because the future of the world is going to be run by a lot of software. Uh, and I would consider that a fundamental skill. It's almost like, you know, instinctively you would learn a foreign language uh, instead of French. No, nothing wrong with learning French, but uh, instead of learning a foreign language, I would focus on learning. Uh, uh, just taking a coding lesson, I think, would be very important. Um, uh, the other thing is, I you know, I, I, I grew up in even though I have a legal training, I grew up as a uh, sort of professionally as a, a finance guy. Uh, I love working with spreadsheets. And I think knowing how to work a spreadsheet uh, is very, very important as a fundamental skill. Uh, not that you want to do a lot of calculations, but you want to understand uh, formulas and the underlying thinking in, in terms of the underlying logic of uh, numbers that spit out in a spreadsheet okay so that's fundamental skills the my other advice is uh diversity of skill sets uh so i would advise you and all of us uh, uh, the students that are listening in uh to take uh courses in uh statistics because the future is going to be about data i think now they have a fancy word for it, it's data science uh, the other course to take is uh, something in psychology. Okay. Uh, uh, I think at the end of the day, I, I'm not a big, very big believer in, in AI taking over the whole world. I think the, the world is still going to be run by human beings 100 years from now. Uh, I think understanding how the human mind works, how cognition works, uh, psychology is very, very important. Uh, you know, in, in business, uh, I come across a lot of people, especially people in leadership positions. One of the most important leadership traits is what we call EQ. Um, having that sense of knowing when to listen, when to speak, uh, when to take a step forward, when to take a step back, uh, that is, uh, a, a good sign of leadership and some people call it judgment as well uh, and uh, uh, traits like humility self-awareness are, are very very important leadership traits and this is something that you normally don't um, don't come across when you you know you would think that leaders have to be strong leaders have to be assertive leaders have to lead and and sometimes uh, you don't leave in as the front person, you lead from the back because when you stay back, you can support the people that you lead. Um, and, uh, you know, you, uh, uh, and a lot of that is getting buy-in from your colleagues. Uh, some of the strongest, strongest leaders in the world have tons of buy-in from the people that they lead, that they work with. And uh, uh, so understanding the human mind, how the human mind works, having that level of EQ uh, will help you in, in uh, being a leader. No, that was awesome. And I think I, I, one thing that I really liked that you talked about was like learning coding almost as a foreign language, even if you're a history major or an English major. And the fact that, you know, this is something that is accessible to all of us to make us sort of have have a bigger toolkit <laughs> to be you know innovate yeah. so i think that was really awesome so um thank you so much like this was amazing um i'm going to turn it back to claire who is going to open it up for q a 
Yes, this was Thanks. very, very interesting, very engaging. And I have a bunch of questions that have been piling up here. So I'm going to um, read them for you, but I'll tell you who has submitted them. So we have a question from uh, Sunny Mehta, an SOM student, 20, class of 21, uh, saying, yesterday it was announced that the uh, athletic surpassed 1 million subscribers despite COVID. Given this news, where do you see the future of sports media going? And how are your properties and teams staying in front of these trends? Oh, that's a big topic. Um, if I knew all the answers, um, I think we would uh, come out of this uh, COVID situation very well. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I think the, the, the question has the right premise which is the sports business is not just a sports business, but it's also a media business. Uh, what is sports without fans, right? So the whole idea is you put on a show, the performance is to uh, please the fans. And something like The Athletic is for like the, uh, the uh, crazy fans, uh, the people who are really into it, into all the ins and outs. If you wanna know everything about the NBA draft coming up and who's going to pick first through 30, uh, you read the, the athletic. And I think there is a market for that kind of thing. Uh, it's uh, a subscription based model. And I think uh, uh, these uh, uh, really good newspapers like the New York Times, Washington Post have proven that uh, subscription based models work uh, if your content is proprietary and you have good content. So, uh, but the, here's the issue though. Uh, I think there are too many competitors like The Athletic. Uh, there's, there's a number of other uh, uh, sports uh, websites or apps that you can, um, you can get a lot of information from. Uh, so there's almost like no barrier to entry uh, in, in the area of kind of specialty uh, information or analysis about sports. Um, there's always gonna be uh, very high quality reporters and, and analysts that will uh, put out very, very good content. So the competition in that space is very, very uh, fierce. Now, about the, uh, uh, the, the, the media business, what I mean is uh, putting on a, a game, the con game content, right? Uh, I think uh, the, the best uh, part of the media business in sports is to own the IP itself. In other words, um, ownership of a team is really, really good because uh, the team, the 30 teams in the NBA together with the league own the intellectual property. Um, and then we will license that intellectual property to the distributors uh, who have access to the fans. Uh, but there's always going to be more distributors than there are owners of the IP. So going to the source and only owning the IP is very, very important in the sports business. Thank you for that. Um, okay, we have a question from uh, Daniel, who is a Yale College a class of 2023 student. What were some of your most influential moments at Yale that you think brought you to where you are today? Moreover, as school is currently online, how do you think we as students can make the best use of the resources we currently have, particularly those that Sci City offers? Um. I mean, there are just uh, so many, so many uh, moments at Yale. Uh, I've benefited so much from from Yale. It's it's kind of hard to pick out just one uh, one or two events. Um, I, I think uh, uh, I guess you know when I was an uh, when I was an undergraduate, uh, some of the best times I've had was uh, hanging out with my uh, fellow students. Um, my, you know, the, I, I was in Branford College. So, you know, I spent a lot of time in the Branford basement. Um, I don't know what it looks like now, but I remember those moments because we had so much fun. Uh, just, uh, you know, sometimes just horsing around, but uh, sharing ideas. Uh, uh, I remember there was a foosball table. So I spent a lot of time uh, there at the foosball table. I would say that just, uh, I, I still think 
you know, very fondly of Yale because of the residential college system. Uh, you know, when I look at other colleges, other universities that don't have that kind of system, uh, they, people just live in dorms or they live in uh, uh, fraternities or sororities. I think they're missing something. So I, I think the, the, the whole residential college system was, is, is the best part of, um, um, you know, my time at Yale. All right, we have a question from um, Archibald Ella, who is a, an EMBA student, executive MBA student, class of 2022. Can you please speak about your experience at Alibaba? What was the most challenging and how did you manage being a COO, CFO, and a founding board member? Uh, I'm sorry, the question is, what is the most challenging? About, about yeah. your experience at Alibaba. Yeah, about yeah. the experience? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, I, after graduating from Yale College, um, I went to Yale Law School straight. Um, I had taken a year off in between uh, first and second year law school, um, but then I you know, finished law school and then I went to work for a law firm. And uh, so I went through an experience where my cohorts, both at school and also at work, have similar uh, sort of backgrounds in terms of education, uh, capability, uh, up, uh, sort of training, if you will. Um, uh, but when you go into the real world, when you work for an operating company, in other words, if you're not working in a law firm or an investment bank or McKinsey, you know, you, when you work in an uh, operating company, uh, then you actually see uh, the diversity of skill sets, the diversity of education, diversity of experiences. Uh, and that was a, a big shock to me uh, when I first uh, went into Alibaba because everybody ha had a different um, sort of educational background. And uh, uh, it was important for me to stay very humble and to, I could have, I could have, you know, been like this, um, you know, really arrogant Yale graduate, Yale law school guy and tell everybody what to do. But I knew I was in a new environment. Uh, I was going into mainland China uh, as somebody who didn't grow up in mainland China. Uh, and I had to, I did most, most of the things that I did was just to listen and observe what was going on. Uh, and uh, I was fortunate enough to have come across a group of founders in the business that were just amazing people. Not, they're not only smart uh, and, and capable, but they're, as, as human beings, like, you know, I wanna go out and have a beer with them. I wanna go out and, uh, you know, have, have conversations with them. These are just incredible people. And I found them in mainland China. And this is, you know, not something that I would expect. Uh, the challenge of, you know, going through different roles. I think I was chief operating officer for a total of three months at Alibaba. Then I was kind of fired from that role um, and went to what, what I was good at, which is uh, being the CFO. I was CFO for 13 years. Uh, and then I uh, stepped away from that. I think the biggest lesson I learned uh, when you uh, are in an entrepreneurial uh, venture, as you scale the business, you have to think about uh, stepping away and letting uh, younger people or other people to come in and take over what you do. If you always want to stay in your position, uh, you run out of bandwidth and the company can't scale. A lot of entrepreneurs get to a certain point, they're afraid to let go or they don't want to let go and the company stop, stops, uh, they, they, they will lose the ability to scale. So you have to think about how do I groom the next generation of leadership in the company? Uh, how do I develop them? You have to have very specific development programs uh, in, in the company. Uh, at Alibaba, the most important thing for us uh, is not money or product or technology. The most important thing for us is people. Uh, and, and we put a lot of focus on identifying uh, uh, people that have potential, uh, giving them every opportunity to move around different jobs, 
uh, and also mentor them. Uh, I, uh, you know, people like Jack Ma, uh, our current CEO, Daniel Zhang, uh, they actually run these uh, mentorship classes. Uh, there are these groups every year, they convene a group of 20 to 30 sort of mid-level managers. And then they will literally uh, go to class with Jack. Uh, I think that's very, very uh, uh, important. It's also an innovative way. You know, you think about the company's founders, they run these internal classes for their mid-level managers and they, they get together and share ideas and experiences. That's a pretty good thing. Thank you for that. Um, Perry Wang, uh, Yale College 2023, who resides in Saybrook College and is from Brooklyn, has a question about the Nets. Uh, he and his dad are um, lifelong Nets fans, and so his question is about owning an NBA team. Can you speak a little bit about buying the Nets from an investment standpoint? For example, what kind of due diligence goes into such an investment? And from a managerial standpoint, um, for example, what do you have to think about in managing an NBA team? Yeah. Uh, so first, you uh, to be successful uh, in the NBA uh, as, a, as a team, uh, you have to understand the, uh, the revenue structure of how teams make money. Uh, you look at a typical NBA team, half the revenues come from uh, tickets. So you got to get the fans into the building. You got to sell tickets. The other half of the revenue comes from the league. Uh, the league itself generates revenue from national TV and international media assets. Uh, so understanding that is, is quite important. Uh, the, the first part of getting uh, butts in the seats and you know, all of that, getting fans in, uh, uh, excited about the team, that's something you can control. The second part, we really leave it up to uh, uh, Adam Silver, the lead commissioner and his team to generate kind of league level revenues. Uh, so it's important to understand that, that, that structure. Um, and uh, uh, so we, 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 the, uh, the, the other aspect of uh, the NBA that's very, very important is uh, the, there's a very fair sharing of economics between teams and the players. Uh, if you go to buy a team in Europe, a soccer team in Europe, uh, there's no salary cap. And uh, uh, so ownership actually ends up, a lot of the owners uh, lose money. Uh, but uh, in the NBA, uh, per the collective bargaining agreement, you basically have a 50-50 share of the economics between players and, and team owners. So in a way, our players are not employees, they're our partners. Uh, in the business and understanding that nature, uh, uh, understanding that they're partners, that they're superstars and, uh, 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 and there's a special way of establishing relationships with players, uh, be, you know, being able to understand that is very, very important to, um, to, to ownership. Um, so, uh, and, and nowadays, uh, you know, to get fans in, into the building, to get them to watch the games, you have to do a lot of marketing. Uh, and I think uh, the focus on social media is very, very important. Um, because of the Nets ownership, uh, I guess this was like two or three years ago, uh, I decided that I started a um, Twitter account so that I can communicate directly with our fans. Um, I'm up to that point, I have never used Twitter. I didn't feel it was something that was important to me. Uh, you know, uh, I, I just can't uh, understand the idea of limiting the number of words that you can post on social media. But uh, because of the Nets, I now have a Twitter account. Well, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have a lot more followers soon, I bet. <laughs> um, so we have a question from Xander Martin, a Yale College student class of 23, and he is on the lacrosse team. Considering your belief in the importance of diversity, what would you suggest to develop more constructive debate and progress between conservative and liberal ideologies? Yeah, oh, by the way, 
Yeah, Xander, really great to hear from you uh, and from someone on the lacrosse team. I think um, I, I was very disappointed that the season got cut short, but I, uh, I did remember seeing you uh, get into a few games. I, I think the Villanova game uh, was the first game of the season, and you were a freshman, right? Or last year you were a freshman and um, got into the game. I, I, I was uh, very excited for you. Um, so uh, how do we I, – I, look, I, I think what, what's important is right now instead of uh, – I, I think right now that sort of the political dialogue in this country and many parts of the world, a lot of these political dialogues, people are talking past each other. We have to have a way of talking to each other. Uh, that's uh, uh, with civility and with respect. I think you have to really respect the other person's, um, you may disagree with their opinion, but you have to respect where they're coming from. And a lot of that is, uh, a lot of the issues that we talk about is historically based. There are, because of history, we have imbalance because of history, we have uh, uh, arguments, uh, problems. And going back to understanding that history uh, is, is always very, very important. And also the other thing is, don't be afraid to confront uh, uh, the, the, uh, the issue um, directly uh, by just talking about, talking very frankly about it. I'll give you an example. Um, this is a very current example. A couple of days ago, we announced that we, we hired uh, Steve Nash as the head coach of the Brooklyn Nets. Steve Nash is a two-time MVP, one of the most uh, you know, talented point guards that ever played basketball. Uh, and uh, for him, you know, it, it was an incredible get for us to be able to convince him that you know, he would come into Brooklyn and coach us, coach our team. Uh, the problem is Steve Nash is white. And in the context of this uh, whole social di justice uh, discussion in the nation, um, uh, we, we came under a little bit of criticism. Uh, I'm sure some of you have, saw, have seen uh, what Stephen Ed said, sorry, Stephen A, uh, Stephen A Smith, what he said on ESPN, he said, Steve Nash got uh, his job because of white privilege. So when Steve Nash was put on the spot uh, during a press conference by a reporter and, and the direct question was, hey, Steve, what do you think? Uh, did you get your job because of white privilege? What Steve said was very sensible and sensitive. Uh, he said, yes, I, I've been the beneficiary of that, um, but uh, I, I don't think that is an issue that applies in this particular case. But having said that, we need to have this conversation, right? Uh, I don't blame uh, neither Steve Nash nor I, Joe Tsai, we don't blame Stephen A for raising that question, even though the example he uses in this particular case, it may be misapplied, but having that conversation is important. Um, uh, so, uh, so I think uh, this is a very good example of, of uh, rather than just shouting at each other and saying, hey, look, we understand white privilege is a issue. We need to talk about it. In this case, it doesn't apply because um, Steve Nash is the best person for the job, but we still are not afraid to talk about it. I think, I think this, is, this is where you need to you know, have, have a rational way of having a discussion uh, on both sides. Um, I know that, you know, uh, we, we're in a very highly charged uh, environment where uh, patients are, people are not patient and tempers are short. Um, but, uh, you know, let, let's, let's have a real discussion about uh, these issues. Great, Joe, if you have the time, I will um, ask a couple more questions before we conclude. Yeah. Sure. Brendan Adkinson, an MD PhD student uh, in his second year, has a question about what would you, um, if you had more time in your life, what would you spend it on? Um, 
would it be a hobby, something you want to learn? You know, what would you choose to focus on? Oh, well, first I want to spend more time with my kids. Uh, so, uh, and uh, uh, I also want to uh, go back and read more history. I, I just think history is very, very important. A lot of the misunderstanding, a lot of the arguments that people are having is because uh, they forget about history and history does repeat itself. I say history repeats itself because uh, what, what I've seen in the recent environment uh, with sentiment in the society, uh, for example, against Asian Americans um, because of COVID and because, you know, the guy in the White House is communicating a message that uh, uh, affects all Asian Americans. Um, you know, during World War II, um, you know, when America went to war with Japan, um, Japanese Americans were rounded up and put into these internment camps because they were not trusted as Americans. I think this is the kind of thing, it, it only happened, you know, like what, 60, 70 years, 70 years ago, it's, it's, uh, it, it could repeat itself. Uh, so uh, I think for me, uh, going back and studying history is very important. I want to, I want to understand the world and I want to understand different cultures. Um, so that's what I'll spend my time doing. Good. And our final question from Prati Agarwal, who's Yale College Class of 2021 and one of our uh, Student Advisory Board co-chairs as well. What advice would you give to students on striking a balance between exploring different fields and taking new risks versus trying to go really deep in a particular field? Yeah, well, um, well, first, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Uh, I think you can go very deep. Let's say if you want to study chemistry, uh, you know, you, you could still uh, try to explore other things. Um, you know, you'll say, well, I only have 24 hours a day. Um, but, you know, you can, you can do it. I think uh, I, I trust that, you know, you guys got into Yale. You guys are smart. Um, you, 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 can, you can do that. Um, and I go back to sort of um, uh, my idea about fundamental skill sets and also uh, some diversity of, um, of subject matters. Um, I would urge you to take psychology and data science as the two sort of uh, required courses um, and learn how to code. Um, and I think equipped with that, uh, you can study anything. You can go deep into any other subject matter and still come out fine. So I think we are low on time. Joe, I want to thank you so much. This has been really informative. It's a pleasure to hear from you always. I hope we can do this again in the future. And Helica and jean Viev, thank you very much for being my fellow moderators. And uh, thanks to the Sci City team for helping pull all of this together and uh, Cecilia from Joe's team as well. Um, quick uh, next steps for our audience. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe to our newsletter. We talked about the importance of social media as well. Follow us on social media. Um, we would also love to get your feedback. There'll be a link that we'll share at the conclusion of this chat that will bring you to a feedback form. And then for students who've joined us today, please engage with us. Sign up for a workshop or find something else of interest. Sign up, talk to us. We would love to meet you and get to know you better. Uh, for those of you already engaged, we look forward to working with you this year. For those of you who joined who are not Yale students, uh, consider uh, volunteering your time to mentor. We often uh, uh, are in need of mentors with specific expertise. So if you're active in the uh, innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem and have some time and would like to connect. All of our connections this year are remote, so that does make it somewhat easier to lend your support to a student who might need it. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Joe. Um, and everybody enjoy the rest of your day or evening, wherever you are. Claire, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.